you, Lord, are the potter. And we are the clay. We're all the work of your creative hands. You take nothing and you make it something beautiful. You knead us out and you smooth out our edges. You mix earth and water and breathe life into a new creation. And you refine your work and you put us on display for the universe to see. Yes, you, Lord, are the potter. And we are the clay. Amen. You can be seated and welcome to our two-year anniversary as a church where we get to, yeah, that's right. We can clap about that. Uh, two years. God has been really kind to us over the last two years, hasn't he? And uh, last uh, September, we were able to celebrate uh, our first year anniversary. Two years ago, September 17th, uh, we launched Summit Life Church, and we did so recognizing that there were there were some tremendous gospel works that were hap happening on the east side that we just get to be a part of as a church family. And as we, as Tiffany and I in 2015 were praying about where we would plant our lives, there was a pastor who was back there visiting, uh, celebrating a wedding. And he saw us in the one of two Starbucks in Florence, South Carolina. And he said, you're from the Northwest. We need churches in the Northwest. Why are you considering Miami? And uh, by God's grace, God used Warren and his family and Essential Church to get us out here as a family and to uh, begin to cultivate and prepare for what the Lord would have in store over the course of the next two years. And as we, as we prayed, we recognized that we could not do this work on our own. We needed God's power in us, but we also needed God's people surrounding us and with us, sharing in the responsibility and the work, the labor that God was laying before before us. And so I, I found myself on my knees praying, God, I don't know how to cast a vision big enough for people to jump into something new. Like, how do, how, do you, how do you cast a vision where people would come and be a part of something new? And by God's grace, five families scattering Pacific Standard Time Zone, Mountain Standard Time Zone, Central Time Zone, and Eastern Time Zone began to pray about what it would look like to relocate their lives to Issaquah and the surrounding community. And as, as those families were praying and considering, uh, we, we were praying for families local to, to catch vision, to be a part of what God was doing in our church and what God would do through our church. And so uh, before we launched, we, we thought we're going to have multiple life groups and, and uh, we will then have public services. Is. But when you have as many kids as we do in our church, uh, it's not that the adults outgrow a house, it's that the kids outgrow the house. And so we had about 22 adults and a bunch of kids. And with the, the bouncing against the walls, we thought, what, what's the next step for us? And so September 2017, we, we said, we're going to do a soft launch. And everyone in our church said, what's that, Will? And I said, well, it's a launch that if it doesn't go well, it gives me the ability to backtrack because I can't, I can't see how this is going to go, but I'm just trusting that God's doing something here as, as families are, are beginning to see a vision for what it would look like to plant a gospel-centered church that's oriented around the Great Commission. And by God's grace, over the course of the last two years, we've had the privilege to meet so many new people. We've seen people come to faith. We've sent people out who have come to faith, and they've landed in other churches and works scattered people, but God continues to gather because God is faithful builder of his church. And so we labor and we show up and we recognize that God does what we can, but we show up because God wants us to steward the opportunities that he's entrusted to us. And a part of that, in two years a celebration, every, every uh, anniversary service, we do a couple things that are special, one of which is we want our kids to be a part of our service. And so parents, if you're stressed to the, to the max, blame that on me, not your children. Uh, I'm the reason your kids are with us because I want your kids to see that they are a part of our church. Uh, kids, I want to see your eyeballs. How many kids are out there? 
You guys are a part of our church and the work that God wants to do in our church. Do you know that? If you have a kid around you, look at them and say, God wants to do something through you. And this morning, what we did in our service to make it extra special for you is Miss Lisa is going to be throwing some pottery for our church that's going to be casting a plate and a cup that we're going to use for the Lord's Supper. We're going to be teaching through 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And over the course of the next however many years that we can keep the plate and the cup from breaking, we're going to be using this plate and cup as we uh, take the Lord's Supper because we're a church that's built upon the gospel. And as we come to the Lord's table in the weeks and the, the months and the years to come, I want you to be, remember, you kids here, remember that God is the one that fashions us in his hands. And so parents, what we're trying to do is make life a little easier for you. So we have a gift for your kids back there next to the check-in table. What I would encourage you to help your kids do is begin to listen and, and take picture notes. Some of, you, some of your kids can't write words yet. Right, and that's all good, but to just draw a picture. What's, what's, what, what's Will talking about? Draw a picture about that. Uh, maybe your kids are learning to sound out words. Just begin to write out the word, and, and they can erase it and then draw the next picture, right? And it should be a great, great celebration for your kids to be a part of. In addition to celebrating what God's done and, and seeing a, a special illustration of what the, the sermon is going to be talking about, the, the passage, the text is going to be talking about, uh, we also have the opportunity to celebrate our first fruit offering. If you've been with us over the course of the last couple months, you know that the first fruit offering is us giving to the Lord the first fruit of the harvest. That we, going into year three, have no idea what year three holds. Can you get amen? Like, I don't know what next year holds, but I, I know who holds next year. And as a posture before the Lord, we just want to grow in generosity uh, where we lay our offering at the feet of Jesus and say, this is not based off of the yield. This is not based off the harvest. This is just a gift right out of the gate. I don't know if there's going to be another crop this year, but I'm going to give you the first fruit. Uh, because you're God and you're worthy, not of our second, not of our third, not of our leftovers, but you're worthy of our first. And, and as that offering is taken, it's going to be going to partner with a church in Pittsburgh, a dear brother who I talked to uh, monthly, sent out from the same church that sent us out here. They're where we were two and a half years ago. Uh, if, if you want to know where that is, let's, let's watch a quick video of Will and Aaron introducing their family because this is, this is where the first, we, we hope to raise some money to support this, this church and we hope to be able to send a, a $10,000 check to this church to help them get off the ground. And so uh, as I've prayed over our first fruit and as you get to pray over your first fruit, uh, we're hoping to be able to send a sizable check to this church. If you're a guest with us, don't, don't feel like you need to give uh, to, that, to that offering. But just a quick introduction to Will and Aaron Cole. Uh, you can watch the, their video. Hey, good morning at Summit Life. My name is Will Cole, and this is my lovely family. My wife, Erin, our son, Samuel, our daughter, Catherine, and baby Oliver is just behind her who's due in six weeks. Um, let me just take a moment to tell you a little bit about our journey. So back in August, my family and I moved from Florence, South Carolina, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we've settled in the township of Cranberry, just north of the city. And we've come here for the purposes of planting a new church in Cranberry. And we just wanted to say thank you as a church plant to a church plant for your prayers, for your partnership in the gospel, and for your generosity. And so I just wanted to give my wife a moment to just tell you a quick story about what God is doing in our neighborhood. So, got to get the kids out of the video. Well, we, they're part of our family, so you had to at least see them. But yes, now we can... Poof, just... they're gone. So we live in a really cool neighborhood full of tons of families. Um, we have two small children and one on the way. And so that's exciting for us because we're able to connect with not only the children, but the the parents. And so surrounding our specific home are families with children, but there's also some single people as well with no children, which is fun for us as adults because we've been able to connect with them, have dinner with them. Um, and just the other night, one of them invited Will just to sit in the driveway and chit chat and just get to know each other, which is huge because they don't know us. We're from the South. 
We've so, all been here for a month. We've been here a month. And so um, that is so exciting. And also just connecting at like the Y. We go to the Y as a family. And so Will's made some connections there. And so the Lord's really starting to like open doors just for conversations, which is huge, um, which is exactly what we want, exactly what we need, you know, to start a church, as you guys know, as you're a church plant. So we are super excited just about the connections we've made and about our neighborhood and the children and the families. So if you guys would just continue that um, in your prayers, that would be great. That's right. And again, we love you guys. We love Summit Life. I know. And we love Will Forrest. And Tiffany. And Tiffany and all their beautiful children. Yes. Um, and we just once again want to say thank yes. you as and a church. Hope to see you all soon. Yes. Yeah, so that's Will and Aaron, and maybe you picked up on this, but relationship is the currency of ministry, and you're like, they're going to the Y, they're talking to people in the driveway, yeah, that's how churches are planted, uh, the people of God engaging in conversations about God, and that, that's the stuff that we still get to be a part of, you want to know how the church grows, has grown through the centuries, it's not through huge marketing uh, advertisement works. It's through the people of God going to the places that God has planted those people. And this morning, we get to just celebrate that truth. We get to pray over Will and Aaron as we, we prepare to give them a gift that will help their church get off the ground. And even the un, unplanned, there's, there's a, a family in our church that has a brother that lives in Cranberry, Pittsburgh. And I'd never heard of Cranberry Pittsburgh until I talked to Will and Aaron, and, and yet God's continuing to do a work through our church. And so I, I'm ready to celebrate. We have a song to sing because our Savior is alive. Do we agree? And our Savior is alive. And this morning we get to celebrate that. So please stand. Welcome two people, and the, and the worship team is going to draw us back to worship. How deep the Father's love flows.
Throughout the course of scripture, we see different pictures of who God is and how he relates to his creation. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet of Jeremiah was sent to the potter's house and was given a message while in the potter's house to deliver to the nation of Israel, displaying God as the potter and the nation of Israel as clay. And the warning that came from Jeremiah, if you're familiar with the prophet Jeremiah's ministry, was to listen to the potter, for he's the one that has authority, and yet the nation of Israel would rebel against the potter's hands, resisting his forming and his correction. And as a result, they'd spend 70 years in, in captivity under the nation of Babylon. And we fast forward to the New Testament and we see Paul and Romans use similarly, how can the clay say to the master's or the potter's hands that, that what should be done for how can the clay speak to the master? And we even get to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 and we see this picture of, of us, God's creation, being the workmanship of, 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 of God, created in Christ Jesus to do good works in which God has prepared in advance for us to do, And this morning we come to 2 Corinthians, and once again we see that we are jars of clay, this picture over and over and over again being displayed for us, uh, revealing who God is and how we are to be shaped by the potter's hands. And as we step into year three, it's my hope that we not only reflect and celebrate all that God has done in our life, but that we would lean into a conversation recognizing what it means to be a part of of an enduring ministry, what it means to persevere in life and faith, because I'm, I'm reminded over and over again in life that just about anyone can start just about anything. Doesn't take a whole lot of skill to start a marathon doesn't take a whole lot of stamina to to start a journey. It doesn't take a whole lot of intellect to to start a class. But if we're going to finish the things that we start or see the things that are started to completion, it requires a level of endurance. And I believe that we're just at the beginning of of this race, of this journey that God has allowed us as a church to be a part of. And as we think through what it means to to be faithful to the work that God's entrusted to us. I, I'm confident that we as a church, median age, relatively young, right? Median uh, uh, demographic, we're, we're younger in life. And, and oftentimes in the front end of the journey, we fail to recognize the value of endurance when it comes to life and faith. For nothing of value can be accomplished overnight. Just last week, Zach taught on the discipline, spiritual disciplines, and, and I just, uh, at the end of the service, said uh, incremental, consistent, small, obedient movement in the same direction over time accomplishes much, but we will not endure over time unless we possess the quality of endurance. This morning, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them there. If you don't have a Bible, there's one provided near you. Uh, please grab that and make it yours. Uh, it's our gift to you. We hope that you'll come to know and love God's word as much as we do. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The book of 2 Corinthians is, is a tag on to 1 Corinthians. If you're familiar with the Apostle Paul, he planted churches. We, we spent eight months in the book of Acts. He's he traveling three different missionary journeys, planting churches. And after churches were planted, much like ours, there was oftentimes a, a need for encouragement or correction. And, and the church in Corinth needed correction, okay? Like if it was a modern church, we likely would shut the doors because of the immorality and the dysfunction. We'd be like, this church is not worth keeping open. There's just too much garbage going on in there. But Paul Uh, Being moved by the Spirit, carried along by the Spirit, writes 1 Corinthians, and he's just saying, you need to change a whole bunch of stuff. They're dysfunctional. Right? And being called to new life in Christ, you you got to deal with this stuff. Walk in obedience to Him. And 
uh, the Corinthian church didn't receive the letter. They, they kind of rejected Paul's teaching. And so 2 Corinthians talks about an awkward visit. You can imagine the awkward visit that would have followed. Like you send a letter to a loved one. You're like, hey, you need to change this in your life. And then they, they say, no, I I'm not going to do that. And then you show up and you see him face to face. And you're like, oh. Right, like cut through the tension with a knife. And, and Paul speaks of this awkward visit in 2 Corinthians in a, in a second letter that he would write to them. And then, then we, we come to 2 Corinthians where Paul's then coming back full circle. After he had seen them face to face, he's, he's, he's reinforcing that, that, that he's forgiven them, that, that they can move on in obedience and faith, that, that all is well. And he's encouraging them with the gospel because what they had done was they, they as they grew as a church, they attracted uh, more uh, prestigious type people who were wealthier, had larger platforms. I, hard to imagine like someone uh, more compelling than Paul, but Paul was a tent maker, right? So just common class, uh, laboring hard so that he could make ends meet and pay his meals. And, and they saw that as some, somehow a uh, 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 undercutting of, of Paul's authority in ministry. And in 2 Corinthians, he, he comes to chapter 4 and, and points out a beautiful truth that, that we are jars of clay and that which we possess within us is the treasure. This morning, when we think through what it means to be a part of an enduring ministry, here's, here's just kind of the main point. Enduring ministry, enduring people embrace the shaping of the potter's hands I think of Israel, they rejected the potter's hands and the potter's plans. I, I, I don't need you, potter. We're, we're the clay. We can, we can function. We can do as we will. And yet, an enduring ministry embraces the shaping of the potter's hands and the direction of the potter's plans. Follow along as I read out of verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, through verse 18. Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So that death is at work in us, but also life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith to what has been written, I believed and, I, and so I spoke. And we also believed and so we spoke, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Verse 16, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light and momentary affliction in preparing for us is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are uh, transient, they're temporary, temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What does it mean to be a people? What does it mean to be a church that embraces the potter's hands and the potter's plans? Three things I just want to highlight for us this morning. It's a far more extensive list than this, okay? We're just, we're just going to tackle three of them. The first is this, that we embrace an unlikely strength. We embrace an unlikely strength. Paul begins this text pointing to the fact that we are jars of clay. What makes a jar of clay an unlikely vessel to be strong? Uh, just look over here to your right. Me and Lisa talked before. She's okay with me pointing this out. We look to the frailty of the clay. This bowl was once standing propped up, and yet clay, until it hardens, is incredibly frail. What makes a jar of clay an unlikely asset, an unlikely strength? The first is this. It's, it, it's frail in nature. One minor mistake. An edge gets too small, too thin, and the clay breaks. One misstep in transferring it from one place to another, and the clay breaks. One degree too hot 
while being under fire and the clay breaks one degree too cold and the clay doesn't harden right. Parents, you'll get this. One misstep by a good intentioned child with a jar of clay and what happens to the clay? It's frail, it, it breaks. What else makes a jar of clay an unlikely power is, is this. It has undisclosed beauty. It begins as a, as a block, plain, nothing to be desired, uh, nothing special. It eventually gets worked into a functional tool, but even when it's worked into a functional tool, until its colors are, are brought out, it's plain. It's unusable. Well, it sets, the function is seen, but it's not fully accessible. Not until it undergoes the process of fire does the clay, does the jar of clay and its beauty and its purpose be fully realized. What else makes a jar of clay an unlikely asset is it's a messy developmental process. So look at Lisa if you wanna see the mess of the developmental process for a jar of clay. Right mixture of clay, right mixture of water to form a new creation. It's a refining work. It's a shaping and even oftentimes a reworking when the clay does not cooperate. And here Paul points out that we are jars of clay, fragile in nature, undisclosed in beauty and messy in development. And yet he says that is one of our greatest assets as we endure in life and ministry. Why? Because of what is inside the jar of clay. You see, Paul had uh, been undercut by the Corinthian church. They had They had thought that he could not be in a position of authority or influence because of the plain nature of his life and ministry. And yet he, in this text, says it's the plain nature of my life and ministry that actually gives my life and ministry value and purpose because I point to the one who gives it value and purpose. So my ability to withstand The pressures of life don't point to my strength for I'm simply a jar of clay, frail, undisclosed beauty, messy in development, but my ability to withstand the pressures and the seasons of life. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes next week. Uh, Life is full of seasons. My ability to withstand those seasons in life point to the treasure, the power that is within. And Paul would continue. He says, not only are we jars of clay with a treasure within us, surpassing power, that is Jesus, but we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. This word afflicted means to, to undergo pressure. You, you look at the, the development of the jars of clay and, and you think, how, how could a jar of clay withstand pressures in life and not be crushed? See, when, when we see the pressures of life creep into a jar of clay, every common sense within us would say that jar is gonna break. And, and yet Paul says, we're afflicted in every way but not crushed. He continues, we're perplexed. Perplexed means to not know what to do, right? to, 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 to have wonder, not wonder, but wonder, right? Like, I'm, gonna, I'm wondering what's next, what do I do? And, and yet, he says, even in the perplexed nature, I don't know what to do, I'm not driven to despair, persecuted, to be hunted or stalked by a predator, So not even a good-intended child coming at the jar of clay, but an ill-intended child predatoring against the jar of clay so that he can break it. And Paul would say, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down, meaning to be literally knocked down. Life, ministry, seasons might make you feel like you are afflicted might make you feel like you are perplexed, might 
make you feel like you are persecuted, may even feel like it's knocking you down over and over and over again. And for the typical jar of clay that is not filled with the surpassing beauty and the surpassing treasure and the surpassing power of God will break. Will break. And yet we come here oftentimes with our broken pieces, right? Because of the pressures, because of the affliction, because of the persecution. And what can we do with a broken piece of clay? We just, we lay it back into the potter's hands. And our ability to withstand the pressures, to endure against the affliction, to persevere in the wondering. solely rests in the power of God within us. And so we, as a church that strives to endure in ministry, we, as people who strive to endure in ministry, in life and in ministry, we embrace an unlikely strength. What makes it unlikely is our equation that's brought to the table, but makes it a strength is God's equation that is at the table. We can bring our broken pieces and, and we can say, God, you can't, you can't do anything with it, this. My, my sin is just too great. I just wanna, I wanna lay before you, your sin might be great, but God's grace is greater. As we come with just pieces of clay, we lay it into the potter's hands and we recognize that no matter how disformed, no matter how broken the clay might be in the master's hands, the clay finds its purpose, and can rediscover God's plans. Second uh, thing I want to draw our attention to, verse 13 through 15. Paul would write, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and so spoke. We also believe and so we spoke. We, we not only embrace an, an unlikely strength, but we embrace the unthinkable message. See, Paul talks about a sequence of speaking. He says, I believe and therefore I speak. Believing should always precede speaking. Belief should precede testimony. Mere speculation about God will not withstand the difficult seasons of life. J.D. Greer in his book, Not God Enough, says shallow uh, glimpses of God are fine so long as your faith is never tested by uh, intense questioning or suffering. And he, he warns that, that if, our, if our belief about God is mere speculation, if our belief about God is, is shallow in nature, it's, it, it may suffice so long as it's never tested with questioning or with suffering. And, and yet we all know, if you've lived long enough, that there are seasons of testing and questioning and suffering, and that should push us into our testimony that our ability to withstand the pressures rests on the strength of God. And we embrace an unbelievable and un thinkable message because as we read the message, we say, why is it that a God who is, who is sovereign all, for all creation would come and, and walk among the clay so that he might take on the brokenness of that clay so that his creation might be restored by faith in him? You see, if you've ever walked through the valley of the shadow of death, you know that it's difficult, if not impossible, to say that you fear no evil unless you know that thou art with you. When we think about what it means to endure in life and ministry, there are seasons where God doesn't lead us around the valley of the shadow of death, but he leads us through it. And if we're going to be a people who can say and look at the, the face of the evil that we're confronted with, that we don't fear it, it's because we know the God who is with us. And here, Paul, verses 13 and 14, he says, we believe and so we speak. See, I'm, I'm afraid that in our life there are artificial things that oftentimes prop us up. And those, those artificial supports might help 
in seasons, but there are seasons and times when you will find yourself alone. And if you truly believe that you're alone and thou art not with you, the persecution, the affliction, the perplexing, the getting knocked down will ultimately uh, cause you to want to give up and to cower. But for the church, we stand up in seasons of difficulty, enduring, persevering, because we have embraced a message that is unthinkable, a message that God can sustain us even if the whole world were to stand against us. And we read stories of missionaries who've lived throughout the centuries and, and they go to places where they, they, they're seemingly by themselves at the end of a spear and people looking at them saying, get out, and yet they can stand with confidence just as Stephen did, as, as those would seek to take his life and he would look up to heaven, right? recognizing that God is the one who is the source of his hope and joy. And then Paul not only says we, we believe and then we speak, rooted in their belief, but he says now, now we, we know that he who raised the Lord from the dead will also raise with you Jesus, raise you also with Jesus and bring us into his presence. And as, as, we, as we look at this text, we, we see that Paul knew something that was really profound, that, that the same one who raised Jesus from the dead could also raise him from the dead. And so every death a trial that Paul was on, every persecution that Paul faced was a prelude to his resurrection. The story was not complete when the persecutors came against Paul, but it was a prelude to Paul's resurrection. And then he goes on and he says, he says because we know, therefore we, we give thanks. It extends more and more people. It may increase thanks to the glory of God. How how often do we confront seasons of difficulty with a spirit of gratitude? You say, why, why are we talking about this year two going into year three? Here's why. Because we want to be a church. I want to be a part of a church. I want to be a person. I want to be a family that endures to the end. I want to cross the finish line well. And I've seen over and over and over again churches start well, but somewhere along the, the, the way they, they grow weary, they grow tired, just as Paul said they would in Galatians chapter 6. And so, so they, they give up, not recognizing that if they do not grow weary in doing good, they will reap a harvest in due time and in due season. The enduring truth that we recognize is that the substance of our belief, namely God, is the hope of that belief. Third thing that I want to draw our attention to is the last portion of this text. Not only embrace an unlikely strength or an unthinkable message, but we, we embrace the unbelievable hope. Verse 16, so we do not lose heart. This is the second time Paul would say this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The beginning of chapter 4, he says, therefore having the ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Here he says, so we do not lose heart. Why would he lose heart? Because of this, our outer self is wasting away. I remember my grandma, she uh, was living with us the latter uh, portion of her life. She was uh, dying from Alzheimer's and uh, sometimes she'd get confused, it happens. And so she le left uh, a hot dog on the stove, uh, water dried up, hot dog burned, filled the house with smoke. She had to get out of there, right? Like house full of smoke. So she just starts walking. And while she's walking in the middle of winter, she slips on the ice. She falls in between the curb, both black eyes, doesn't break her nose. Not sure how that's possible. I go to the hospital to visit with her. And uh, in a moment of her just kind of being there, she says, Will, it takes a lot of courage to grow old. As her outer self is wasting away, it is easy to lose heart. And yet Paul says, we do not lose heart, even though, not, not what if, but even though the outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed. We, how often is it being renewed? Day by day. Why do we need day by day renewal? Because every day we're reminded that the outer self is wasting away. It's not, it's not enough to hope once 
and, and never hope again. It's not enough to renew our mind once and never, never be renewed again. Why? Because the outer self day by day is slowly reminding ourselves that, that there is a day where we will give account for our life. And Paul says, even though that self would waste away, we are being renewed. We do not lose heart because we are being renewed day by day. He continues and says, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The treasure that's within the jar of clay is one day going to be fully disclosed. Its beauty is going to be fully revealed. That which we see dimly today one day will be on grand display where all creation, as Philippians 2, will recognize that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And so I press through the valley of the shadow of death knowing that thou art with me. I don't run from his rod and staff for it's his rod and staff that comfort me. And I find comfort knowing that he is the good shepherd leading me towards a place that is beyond all comparison where he rightfully reigns and all things are rightfully restored. See, if we're not renewing our mind day by day, we will forget to embrace this unbelievable hope because every day there are new signs of the deteriorating self and Paul would say, we are being renewed day by day. Enduring truth, our hope does not rest in what we see, but in our confidence in what is not yet seen, but will one day be on full display for all to see. We're a church that has set out to be deeply rooted in the gospel, oriented around the Great Commission which means we are gonna be in seasons of high and seasons of low. And yet in both of those seasons, our hope rests in the same place and that place where our hope rests is in God. And as we consider what it means to be a church that would endure, not just through year two, not just through year, year three, not just through year four, but a church that truly endures impacting the kingdom of God here in Issaquah, moving forward the mission of God in spite of those who would stand against us, right? That the gates of hell would not prevail against this work. It means we're pushing into places where there's opposition, which means we are a church that has to learn what it looks like to endure, to persevere, to be shaped by the potter's hands and to embrace the potter's plans. And I'm, I'm encouraged that over the last two years, there has been a shaping of our body. Are you guys encouraged? I hope you're encouraged. I've been encouraged that God has shaped our body. I've been encouraged that God in his shaping is, is continuing to, to reveal to our church our unique contribution to the gospel work on the east side. I want you to know that you're an important part of that. And as, as long as I'm the pastor and as long as God gives me breath, we are committed to the mission of God, both in our city and around the world. I celebrate every week we have somewhere from, not a big church, but we have about nine different countries represented here in our gathering. I celebrate that. Why? Because God's not just doing a work here in Issaquah, but he's doing a work around the world. And, and we just get glimpses of that work as we faithfully persevere in life and in ministry. I'm going to call the worship team to come up. And a part, a part of that, and, and again, I don't, I, we're, we're going to take our first fruit offering here in a, a second. But a part of that is, is this idea of being shaped and engaging in a work that is bigger than us. Right, we are a piece of a much larger tapestry. You guys believe that? We are a piece of a much larger tapestry. And, and there are so many churches that grow discouraged because all they can see is their little piece rather than looking at the tapestry. Like, do, you, do you know that churches are being planted around the greater Seattle Puget Sound region? 
every year there are new churches being started. There are, certainly there are churches that, that are closing their doors because of the struggle and, and the difficulty in, in planting, but there are churches being started. Like, like the people of God have not given up on the mission of God, and so churches are continuing to be started in our city. You know, every, every weekend there are churches opening their doors around our country. I know you, we read news articles, we talk about the decline of the church, that's, and, and, and that can be scary and, and defeating, but there is a, there's a people of God who are rising up under the mantle of the mission of God and starting churches every weekend around the country. Do you know that God's church is growing faster in parts of the world where there's opposition, where government would stand against that growth, and yet God's spirit's moving among God's people and using the word of God to draw people to faith and change lives like our God has not given up on his people so we come under that that mission and that mantle and and in a small way get to participate in that work every week when we gather and and celebrate and when we give to just out of of our tithes I want you to know as a church we we just commit 10% of our uh, local giving to missional works cooperative works outside of our church and so we partner with a Chinese uh, Mandarin speaking church plant in Bellevue that we have begun to put seed money towards a partnership in Peru and and link arms with some churches within our network, what it looks like to potentially be a part of a a work in Lima, Peru. Like we're a church two years old. I don't know what that looks like, but I just know that God wants us to be on mission. We have have a unique opportunity just timing wise as we celebrate our second anniversary to be a part of a work that God's doing in, in Pittsburgh, in Cranberry, Pittsburgh, a place I've never been. And yet a place where God is sending people to be a part of his mission. And so we, we set a goal before our church. Uh, the goal was 10% of our annual giving. Uh, why that? I think it'd be cool to be a part of a church that gives 20% of their local giving to missions. I think it'd be cool to be a part of a church that gives 30% of their giving, local giving to missions. I think it'd be cool to be a part of a church that, that gets to a point where they can give half of what they, they take in on a weekend to missions. Like, I just want to grow in generosity, Lord, by 1% this year, by 1% next year. And someday I'm going to look back and I'm going to say, God, you just, you, you bless so that I could continue to bless others. And 1 Corinthians says that God extended comfort to the Corinthians so they could extend comfort to other people. And I, and I believe on the east side, God's extended some, some tremendous things to us as the church on the east side so that we could extend those things to others. And a part of our first root offering is just a demonstration of that. Right? I don't, I, and I, I want to be clear, I don't, I don't care the number that we come up with in our giving. We're going to keep it open through the month of October. I'm not, I'm not so concerned about the number. I'm, I'm concerned about leading us towards generosity that we're a church that we're a people that's growing in generosity and leading our kids to be a part of a work that calls them to generous living just yesterday I sat my kids around the table I said hey here's what generous living looks like we give every month we give to the church because we believe in the work of the church every month we give and every year we have a unique opportunity. I want you to know we're, we're a church. It's not every quarter I'm coming to you and tap, to tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, give more, give more. If you've been with us for a year, you've probably heard me talk about giving last first fruits and then this first fruits. But I sat my kids around the table. And I said, every year we have the opportunity, first fruit offering. Here's what we as a family are going to give this week. And God's been kind and allowed me to teach some classes online. I get paid middle of October. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, double that gift offering by the end of October. We just, we just want to be a part of the mission of God, and I don't, I don't know of any better place to invest your resources. And so, in a moment, as the worship team leads us in song, uh, if your family's around you uh, and you want to participate in this offering, I would encourage you in, in a in a way that's respectful to the people around you. Just kind of circle up and, and pray over your gift, your first fruit gift. And once you're done praying, I, I, I'm praying the Lord multiplies what we give, right? Last year, our church, $6,000, the first fruit offering. And about a month later, got a call from a partner church saying, hey, we've raised $60,000 for your building renovations. That was unexpected. <laughs> Lord, multiply the offering. Gather around with your family and and pray over that offering. You can make your way up. You can see finished jars of clay and the beauty that has been revealed.
revealed by the master's hands and the refining fire of that master. You can drop your offering in there. There's first fruit envelopes that just help us track where you're wanting your giving to go. We also on our app have giving and you can just identify that you want it to go to your first fruit so you don't even have to come up. You can talk to your kids, give via the app. Uh, we're going to be singing a song. You don't have to feel pressure to come up and be a part of this, but we, we just we want to be a people that are, that are modeling for one another and for our children what it means to be deeply rooted in the gospel and orient around the Great Commission. So let, let me pray for us. The worship team is going to lead us in song, and uh, then we'll come up and pray over the offerings after we give. God, uh, we recognize that we are clay within your hands and that you are shaping us into a people that display not our beauty, but the treasure that is within. And as we withstand the seasons of life, we, we do not point towards our strength. We do not point towards our message. We do not point towards our hope and the hope that's found in our strength. But God, we, we just simply point to the treasure of surpassing worth that is within us. So, Lord, we do not boast in anything other than you. And we ask as we, uh, once again, are committed to being about you and your work, Lord, that you would take our offering and that it would be pleasing to you as our first fruit portion. Not knowing what the yield or the harvest this year brings, but knowing that you are God over all of that. So Lord, we sing and we say, oh, what a Savior. A good, good shepherd, one who has pursued, one who has saved, and one who is within us, sanctifying, changing us to be more like you. We love you, Lord, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Please stand. If you want to participate in the offering, just circle up, pray over your gift. Bring it up and the worship team's going to release us.
has anyone ever felt like life has made them look like this? <laughs> uh, I certainly have. Uh, and the good news is this is usable in the right hands. And as we throw the clay back into the potter's hands, he can form us and shape us and rework us into the workmanship that points to Jesus Christ and engages in the work that's been prepared in advance for us to do. I, I'm confident there are going to be moments over the next three to five to six years, maybe even three to five to six weeks, where we feel like this. But as we uh, commit to be an enduring church, this is not the end of the story. In fact, this just increases the testimony and the master craftsmanship of the potter. So we, we point to the potter as the hope of all creation. And this morning, I, I, I hope you're encouraged, being reminded that God's doing a work in you. Kids, you did awesome. You guys did awesome. I know, like, I don't dance and sing as good as your kids' life teachers, but you were awesome, and it was a joy to have you guys in service with us this morning. I want you to know that you're an important part of the work that God's doing in our church. Parents, uh, I want you to know I like the sound of kids. That's why I have four of them. Uh, so don't ever, don't ever feel shy about having your kids participate in our service. And I, I want you to know that we are praying over this offering that God would multiply it for his kingdom and for his cause. And, and I get that the giving is kind of a weird thing in, in timing, right? Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to leave that first fruit offering open through the, the month of October so that if you desire to be a part of that, that you can uh, work it into your, your budget. I hope this morning you're encouraged. Uh, God is not done with us yet. Uh, he's just simply not. And we are at the beginning of our journey. And as we press forward and press on, uh, we are committed to enduring. I'm thankful for you. It's a privilege to serve as your pastor, uh, and as we reflect on what God's done, might it propel us forward to what God will do as he uh, continues to work through our church's life. I'm thankful for you, praying for you this week. God bless. Oh, we, uh, we have a piece of cake for you. Uh, and the, oh, and, oh man, thank you. For, my wife is so good. Hand motions from the front row are really important. <laughs> We're stepping into a new season of, of church life. We're, we're renovating the building, and as we put our name on this new building, we, we wanted to reconsider what this looks like for us as a, a church to, to print, and we, we sat down with some of our graphics and creative arts team, and we're like, we just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're thinking well about what we do because we care about what we do. And a part of that process is we were, we were able to, to rework our, our uh, Summit Life logo. And so over the course, I think we got it back there on the PowerPoint. Yeah, that looks like the mountains of the Pacific Northwest, doesn't it? Uh, so over the course of the next few weeks, as things get reprinted, as we put logo on building, um, that, that's going to be the logo that, that you begin to see rolled out. Uh, we want to make sure you guys were aware of that on our second anniversary uh, as our signs are wearing out and need to be replaced anyways. Um, and on the cake, which is what made me think of it, on the cake is the new logo. And so, uh, yeah, let's, let's say thanks to our creative arts team. Uh, stick figures is the best that I do. And so I'm thankful for the gifting of, of uh, and, and the investment of that. So we got cake, we got cupcakes, we have gluten-free stuff. We have probably not sugar-free stuff, but gluten-free stuff. Uh, help yourself, stay around, celebrate what God's doing. Thankful for you guys. God bless.